thank you, Tom. And welcome to anybody who, welcome to all, everyone who's here and also an, anyone who's listening in. It's an enormous privilege to be here and have so many people um, come along. For, I think one of the first times I heard Carl Henry was after an, uh, um, uh, before an Alvin Plantinga lecture in New Zealand. Um, I gave an effusive warm welcome um, to Al Pantinga singing his praises, which was very easy to do in the case of Al Pantinga. Um, and he responded by citing Carl Henry, you've probably heard this umpteen times before, who, um, after a very um, vigorous and enthusiastic welcome, opened with prayer, saying, um, forgive that man, Lord, for all the lies he's just told, and forgive me for enjoying them so much. So, uh, um, Thank you, Tom, for a very uh, warm and gracious welcome. And thank you also for arranging this and for Geoffrey and Heather. I mean, the, um, the administrative side of the Henry Institute is considerably more than impressive. Um, so thanks for that. 2016 is an exciting time to be a theologian for at least three reasons. First, because it's always an exciting time to be a theologian. The explanatory power of Christian theology is unparalleled. It sheds transforming and liberating light on almost every facet of human life. On metaphysical questions, and anthropological questions, ethical and sociopolitical. There are not many disciplines where you have that kind of compass um, of explanatory power. Second, it's an exciting time because it is almost certainly the case that in the last um, um, month, more people in the world have become Christians than at any point in the last 2,000 years. Theologians have the opportunity and responsibility, therefore, to present the riches of Christian thought to billions of people. Pew tells us that by 2050, there will be 3 billion Christians and 10% of the world's population will be Protestant Christians. Third, it's exciting to be a theologian because of the transformation that has taken place in the field closest to theology, namely analytic philosophy of religion. Can I just stop there a minute? Um, can I get my computer? I've got a, a, a previous version of my paper. One second. Um, And third, because the tra oh, third, it's exciting to be um, a theologian because of the transformation that's taken place in the in the field closest to theology, and that's analytic philosophy of religion. As a result, we have witnessed the desecularization of the academy um, in the last four decades. Forty years ago, when I was a, um, a philosophy student, and um, philosophy was a source of grief for most Christians. Indeed. You could count on the number um, of uh, um, a mutilated hand, the number of non-closet non Christian academic philosophers. And J.L. Mackey, the famous um, Oxford um, philosopher, um, produced an argument to show that it was, um, or ostensibly to show that it was logically incoherent to be um, a theist, given the problem of horrendous evil. Um, so at that point um, athe um, atheism had seized once and for all the inner sanctum of the academy but now largely due to the intellectual courage and Christian conviction of Alvin Plantinga we have witnessed a sea change in the field of philosophy so much so that there are now four and a half thousand members of the societies of Christian philosophy and there's not much overlap between the different societies, so I'm not double counting here. Another uh, more significant indication is an article on the metaphilosophy of naturalism written by the atheist philosopher Quentin Smith when he was editor of Philo. That's the Journal of the Society of Humanist Philosophers. Its opening section is entitled The Desecularization of the Academy. He writes... By the second half of the 20th century, universities and colleges had become, in the main, secularised. Theism possessed such a low epistemic status, as a quotation, 
that it didn't meet the standards of an academically respectable position to hold. With the writings of Alvin Pandega, however, naturalists passively watched as realist versions of theism, most influenced by Plantinga's writings, began to sweep through the philosophical community. Until today, perhaps one, and a quarter, one quarter to one third of philosophy professors are theists, with most being orthodox Christians. And then he writes, God is not dead in academia. Now, I, had, um, I asked Brian Leftow, who's a um, professor in Oxford, about that. We were talking about this. And he told me he'd actually done, his, he'd actually done the calculations. And he said, it is actually um, one in four analytic philosophers who are now um, theists. That is one dramatic change in, in, um, in only four, in 40 years. And then he continues... Such is the erudite brilliance of theistic philosophizing today that any naturalist philosopher refereeing a debate between theists and a naturalist, that's metaphysical naturalist, atheist, um, any atheist uh, refereeing a debate between theists and naturalists would be likely to determine that, quote, the theists definitely had the upper hand in every single argument or debate. He then concludes that the justification of atheism has been defeated by arguments developed by theistic philosophers. And now, quote, now, you won't hear this from Dawkins, naturalist philosophers, for the most part, live in darkness about the justification of naturalism. He continues, if naturalism is true, then their belief in naturalism is accidentally true, end quote. That is by a leading atheist um, philosopher, metaphysician and logician. Not far away, he's in Michigan. So why has the epistemic status of theism changed so rapidly? Why is God suddenly respectable again in academia? Well, in, certain, in, in the parts of academia which really count. One reason is that theism has unrivaled explanatory power. It explains why there's something rather than nothing. All right, though that's, that's a fairly casual way of stating it. Some, something... Um, um, rather than um, anything other than God. God's, of course, a necessary being, so there can't be nothing, all right? But that's how we normally phrase it. He explains why there's something, anything contingent at all. It explains the intelligibility of the universe. That is why, why science can function. Every scientist assumes the intelligibility of the contingent order. It explains the existence of a moral order or moral purposiveness, without which science loses the very grounds of its conceptions of truth and accountability, of duty and obligation. It also explains the fine-tuning of the universe. To just give one example, I'll just mention this briefly. Most of you will know about this, but just very quickly. Stephen, Hawking's, uh, Stephen Hawking comments, quote, We know that there has to have been a very close balance between the competing effect of explosive expansion and gravita gravitational contraction, which at the very earliest epoch about which we can um, even pretend to speak, that's Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang, the, the, um, the balance would have, con uh, would have corresponded, corresponded to the incredible degree of accuracy by a deviation in the ratio from unity by only one part in 10 to the power 60. Right, that's one tiny example of fine-tuning. John Jefferson Davis famously argued that uh, an accuracy of one part in 10 to 60 is comparable to firing a bullet at a coin-sized target 20 billion light years away and hitting it. Any idea why, why we can have 20 billion light years when the, um, when the universe isn't that old? Because the universe is expanding, of course. But there's one enormous challenge to the... Um, um, we could, oh yeah, so, so Roger Penrose um, is one of... Um, the UK is and Europe's leading scientist. He's not a Christian. But he's argued that our universe is one of, wait for it, 10 to the power 10,123 possible universes, only one of which would have had the amount of order um, to produce the complexity we observe. Um, Rodney Holder comments that the numbers involved here are greater than the number of protons in the entire visible universe. In short, the reason to embrace atheism in the face of the arguments is not particularly bright, no matter 
how many in your local community choose, choose to do so. But there's one enormous challenge to the belief in a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and perfectly good. And that is the existence of evil. It is this that has led Tim Mulgan, who's a very able philosopher, to write in a, in a book just came out and published by Oxford University Press in 2015, um, to advocate what he calls, it's just almost impossible to say this expression, and they, they should do away with the breathalyzer test in, in Scotland. If you can say this expression, you're stone cold sober, okay? It's ananthropocentric purposivism, right? He advocates ananthropocentric purposivism. Purposivism is that there's clear, clear evidence of purposiveness in the universe, in the universe, but that purposiveness doesn't involve human beings being in any way central to those purposes. An anthropocentric purposivism, okay? So even if we go with all these, I think, enormously convincing arguments for the existence of, 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 of God, um, we're left with this puzzle. How do we make sense of um, um, the hum human experience in this context? Now, the long-standing definition of the problem of evil, um, of, of the problem is that evil appears to generate a logically inconsistent quintet of propositions. I'll just read through, through these and then shoot on. One, this is the first proposition, God exists and is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good. Two, evils exist. P1, a perfectly good being would always eliminate evil so far as it could. P2, an omniscient being would know all about evils. Three, there are no limits to what an omnipotent being can do. But the conjunction of 1, 2, P1, P2, and P3 seems to form a logically inconsistent quintet. This is because whichever four propositions you select seem to involve the denial of the fifth. In particular, the last four entail the denial of the first, that God exists as a perfectly um, good, omnipotent, and omniscient being. While the first combines with the last three to, deny, to, to entail the denial of the second, that evils exist. And not very many people are keen to deny that evil exists. You do get some, but not very many. It was largely the problem of evil that prior to Alvin Plantinga's defense of theism, as I mentioned already, led the vast majority of philosophers to consider theism irrational, if not illogical. Now, famously, Al Plantinga established by means of his free will defense that there is no logical contradiction. Um, he pre presented us with a scenario in which the five propositions were not, where there, where there was no logical contradiction or incons inconsistency between them. Right? So he disposed of J.L. Mackey's argument. And then since then, and various attempts have been made to soften the blow that evil does to the Christian theism. Um, first, some, of course, some, um, for example, suggest that the source of evil can be traced to higher beings, fallen angels, and the like. Now, even if evil in the forms in which we experience it can be explained in this way, it still doesn't quite solve the problem. The question remains um, how these higher beings came to be evil and why God would allow such beings to and cause such hideous suffering um, to, to human beings to promulgate evil so successfully. B, it's also been argued that a world without any evil would be considerably less, than, less appealing than we think. Imagine for a moment a world in which there was no human suffering of any kind. Clearly there would be no pain, no illness, but also we would never be short of anything. We'd never have to wait for what we wanted. Every desire would have to be instantly satisfied. Clearly, the inhabitants of this world wouldn't have to go out of um, their way to help anyone, or provide for them, or defend them, or make sacrifices. Given that there could be no suffering, it would be a world without sympathy, without empathy, or solidarity in the face of opposition. There could be no costly self-giving, one would never be in a position that involved risk or cost or self-sacrifice for the sake of another. There could be no altruism or compassion or forgiveness or reconciliation. Humanly speaking, 
it's hard to know what love would look like or moral virtue. And how appealing is that world? Okay? So um, that's it's an argument that some people treat with some disdain, but it raises some questions. But it also raises a, a very obvious question. Suppose we grant that some suffering may be allowable to generate the virtues and forms of loving that so enrich human life. Or suppose we suggest that some degree of suffering is the inevitable consequence of that very great good, which of course is, um, is, is free will, for those of you who aren't Calvinists. Is it really the case that we need quite as much suffering as there appears to be? Can we really suggest that holocausts, torture, the large-scale sexual abuse of children, not to mention stillbirths, and loss of babies, which is unthinkable suffering that that causes in parents and families. Is it, does it really make sense to suggest that those, kind, that those kinds of evils, um, both moral and natural evils, are warranted by these perceived benefits? Is it really compatible with God's goodness that we have this kind of suffering? Now, Peter van Inwagen has famously used vagueness theory to suggest that this kind of question has logical problems. Any argument that implies that there's a precise amount of suffering uh, and that God is justified in allowing raises logical problems by assuming unjustifiable metaphysical exactness. Now, I'm not going to go into that. Suffice it to say, the debate goes on. And there's a lot of work, an enormous amount of work, that's shedding all sorts of very helpful light on how we should and shouldn't and may or may not think about the problem of evil. But let's step out of the debate for a minute. The very enterprise of theodicy itself raises some questions. First, what exactly would it mean if we were to succeed in producing every philosopher religion's dream? Suppose we were to succeed in producing a knock-down, drag-out theodicy that finally completely exonerated God and justified God in the face of horrendous evil. One that really worked. Well, might it not suggest that this world, with its earthquakes, its childhood cancer, and its moral evil, as well, um, is the entirely good outworking and expression of God's omnipotent and omniscient will for his creatures? The danger would be that when we saw a natural tragedy or a hideous moral evil, um, the only appropriate response would be to say, hallelujah, praise God. All that appears to be evil would in actual fact constitute a feature of God's beautiful and perfect will for the contingent order. Now I'm not saying that there might not be theodicies that can get around this, but we need to be careful that our defense of God doesn't succeed either in suggesting that God's not really sovereign, it's one big temptation. And, or giving evil a good and proper place within the totality of God's purposes. The second problem with, with this kind of approach is the orientation towards God that theodicy adopts. What's happening in theodicy? We are placing God in the dock. And then we wait upon the counsel for the defense to provide convincing justification that God isn't found guilty by us of the charges of crimes against humanity. For as long as we are seeking an answer to the why question, or the how could you God question in the face of suffering, that is the kind of way we are going about addressing the issues. That's the kind of stance we adopt vis-a-vis the one who alone is holy. The third feature of this kind of approach is that too easily it thinks from a base which perceives of our stance before God as a relationship to a third personal reality, as a he, or worse, an it, rather than as thou. The implication is that in order to address God reverently and joyfully as thou, we first need to get the lawyers in, or, you know, the counsel for the defence, the philosophers, to confirm that he or it isn't the greatest perpetrator of evil that planet Earth could ever know. In sum, 
from a Christian epistemic base, we need to ask ourselves, is it really appropriate for me to ask, in the context of prayer, of the God who comes to us as Jesus Christ and by his spirit, are you guilty of crimes against humanity, Lord? Because I need an answer to that before I can worship you. Indeed, before I can even believe, um, agree to believe, decide to believe in you. Now, to be fair, there could be a form of, of prayer that is appropriate. Like the following. Lord, if it be your will, give us eyes to see your purposes in the context of what appears to be hideous and meaningless and purposeless evil. But the person who prays that already knows that they can trust that question to God. In sum, interpreting the problems of human suffering as a question to be addressed by theodicy raises questions. Under what conditions is it a reverent exercise? Is it the kind of questioning that is appropriate in Christo, in Christ, with a reconciled mind, with that mind which is in Christ Jesus? And if it isn't, should we, should we seek to provide a grand unified theory of reality that reconciles God and evil? Okay, there's lots, I'm, I'm, I'm being controversial in a lot of what I'm saying. I'm stirring, so you'll be relieved to know that at the end of this lecture there'll be a chance um, you know, to sort me out. Okay, and there'll be a chance for a decent period of question and discussion. Okay, now for another tack. Thinking about suffering with the mind of Christ. In the book of Job, after Bildad the Shuhite engages in various kinds of theodicy, or theodicy-like suppositions, we find Job in chapter 9 verses 32 to 33, either venting his frustration that there's nobody to bring God and his creatures on trial together or raising the question of the propriety of theodicy. For he is not a mortal as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There's no umpire or judge between us who might lay his hand on us both. Then in chapter 10, we find him venting his grief, giving free utterance to his complaint. Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as humans see? Job assumes that God is supposed to ensure some kind of correspondence between deeds and consequences. But God, it seems, has messed up. There's been a cosmic accounting error. And so he fantasizes that there might be some judge higher than God, such that the two could appear in court together, and God would be forced to acknowledge the error, the injustice perpetrated against Job and his family. Alas, there is no higher authority for Job, so Job is trapped in his circumstances. That seems to be what Job, the argument. That's Job's fantasy. The answer God provides is a response to this, but a response that completely redefines the questions. The request, or the wish, or, or the desire for an umpire between God and humanity is addressed in the person of the sole mediator between God and humanity, the, the man Christ Jesus, one who emphatically does have eyes of flesh, who does see as humans see. Hence we have God addressing our questioning, not with theoretical answers to the theodicy question, indeed not with answers at all, of at least certainly not of a certain kind, but rather by taking our questions to himself, by identifying with our suffering, our grief, our loneliness, our sense of betrayal, our experience of violence and abuse, and of course, injustice, public humiliation, 
mocking and violent murder. There's even a discussion, you probably, some of you will have seen the article in Princeton Theological Review as to whether um, references to Jesus' um, nakedness um, and being mocked and so on um, might even have implied that there was sexual abuse going on, that, that Jesus might have um, suffered something that has, uh, hasn't traditionally been assumed he, he did. I'm not sure the evidence is very convincing, but I don't see any theor- theoretical reason why um, Jesus didn't, um, wouldn't, might, might not have done so. Nowhere does God's word to us provide an answer to the why question. What is interesting, however, is that contrary to what the world assumes, it's not an answer to the why question that those who suffer really seek. Last month, two twin boys who were only two years old drowned in a fish pond in the back garden of their home just a few miles from where I live. It's the most devastating tragedy. And the interview with the parents a few days later was just heart-rending. Would parents in an unthinkable situation like that really be helped by an answer to the why question? Is their suffering going to be eased and their confidence in God restored by saying, this is why, by God saying, this is why I let this happen to your children? Um, and this is why it fitted in well with my purposes. Any answer of that kind, I think, might be perceived to be abhorrent. The subliminal answers, the subliminal questions to which an answer would really count is not the why question, but the who question and the where question. Who is God and where is God now? And what the who question is, is really asking, can I really trust the ultimate well-being of my children to God? An answer to the where question, I think, displaces the why to some degree. That's because we can handle leaving the why question with God when we are given to hear the gospel's answer to the where question. And as I shall argue, It is this question to which the gospel provides such a profound answer. An answer that functions at a whole raft of different levels. But it is also at precisely this point that the contemporary church has played down and even lost sight of the most pertinent and relevant affirmation at the heart of the New Testament witness. And to explain we're going to have a look at history. And I'm going to look at the roots of contemporary evangelical Christianity and to the history, more specifically, of the European settlers who came to New England. It's a story I've discussed elsewhere, so I'll be very brief. In 1625, Charles I became king of England. He'd inherited from his father, James VI of Scotland, the quintessentially Scottish conviction that his views and policies were divinely ordained. To challenge his views or or policies constituted blasphemy, therefore. Now, as every British school child knows, the Scottish Covenanters and the Puritans in England vehemently opposed the doctrine of the divine right of kings. Following Calvin, they proclaimed that There is only one king with any divine rights that we recognize, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as every American high school kid knows, on the enthronement of Charles I, Puritans, these Puritans, started leaving English shores, right? That was good for the average IQ, by the way, of both countries, you'll as you'll appreciate. Um, Puritan started leaving English shores and setting sail for New England, driven by a vision for a new democratic society, famously articulated by John Winthrop. As the Tocqueville has shown, Puritanism provided American democracy with a solid foundation by acknowledging one Lord and one King, under whom we are all created equal. A theological vision of 
that underpinned the democratic ideals of both America and the UK. It's a great vision. Now, back at the ranch, back in the UK, when Charles then manipulated the Episcopal system of government to impose a priestly hierarchy on the church, which he controlled, of course, having his divine rights, it, g- it gave rise in 1639 to what the so-called Bishop's Wars, which led ultimately to the defeat of the cause of the king in the first civil war. Why on earth is Alan Torrance relating this piece of history in a talk on God and suffering? Has he completely lost the plot? Well, because those events almost 400 years ago had an unquantifiable impact, not only on worship, both in the UK and in the United States, but also on the whole way we think about God's relationship to us. And the consequences have shaped our thinking, both focally, but also subliminally. And they're pertinent to the question we're looking at today. The Puritans and the Covenanters opposed the divine right of kings by insisted, insisting they recognised only one king with divine rights, namely Jesus Christ. So when Charles I and Archbishop Laud sought to impose a priestly hierarchy, how did they respond? We recognise only one priesthood in the church. And whose was that? Yeah? Who do you think? Jesus Christ? No. The priesthood of all believers. That's the only, that's the only priesthood we recognise. The priesthood of all believers. Not our Lord Jesus Christ's priesthood. Ours. Tragic betrayal of all that Calvin had so vehemently advocated um, in, in Geneva. Their democratic concerns resulted in this in a tragic departure from Calvin's emphasis on the sole priesthood and sole ministry of Jesus Christ. Christ's priesthood was displaced by ours. Christ's sole mediation was displaced by mine. We became our own mediators before God. God's profound response to Job was all but lost sight of. And the impact and consequences have been immense. The focus in worship and prayer was transferred to the individual, to the self. I become my own priest, sole mediator of my own worship and and my free prayer. God and Jesus Christ are the object of my worship, my reflection my theological speculation, and so on. The effect was to distance Christ from believers and their struggles. Two, Two consequences. Either talk about Jesus Christ collapsed into talking primarily about his work on the cross. There are churches that I've attended who reference to Christ amounts to little more than reference to the saving power of the cross. Or we worship a sovereign king who lords it over his creation. And what happened, in effect, was a subtle fracturing of the communion between God and humanity and between humanity and God that is held forth en Christo. That phrase appears 137 times in Paul's letters, in Jesus Christ. When we cease to see Christ as our sole mediator, our representative, our priest, the whole way we think about God in relation to suffering changes. The fundamental theological question shifts from the where is God's question that the gospel addresses so spectacularly and so profoundly to the question, why does the sovereign God allow me to suffer this evil? The response to suffering becomes the attempt to reconcile the sovereign will of the king we worship up there with the reality of my individual predicament down here. And what's lost is the underlying grammar of the gospel that sees God radically identifying in the person of our soul priest with our predicament down here. And that in the person of Jesus Christ, we find Emmanuel, Emmanuel, 
the one whoever lives with us to intercede for us in and through our struggle with evil, with death, with pain, with sickness, suffering and loss, and when we can no longer find the words to pray as we ought. What I wish to suggest is that there is a whole grammar and communion which witnesses to a far more relevant way of thinking about God and human suffering than anything that theodicy could offer. To think about God's relationship to suffering by stepping outside of that communion is to do precisely that. It's to step outside of it. It's to cease to think about God's relationship to us with reconciled minds. It's to try and think about it by bracketing out that mind which was in Christ Jesus and which we are given to share. So, my final section, rediscovering the grammar of communion and participation. The primacy of a second person approach. And here I'm borrowing a little bit from Eleanor Stump and Andrew Pinson, both of whom have written really um, powerfully on these questions. So first, a little bit of a reminder of some absolutely key biblical emphases without which we will get this, this grammar wrong. First of all, covenantal versus contractual as second personal versus third personal ways of thinking about God's relationship to humanity. The key concept in the Bible that characterizes God's relationship with humanity is berit, covenant. No single factor in Western and evangelical theology has done more to undermine the Christian concept of belonging than the mistranslation of this concept as contract. So what is the difference between a covenant and a contract? Biblically speaking, a covenant is a promise binding two people or two parties to love one another unconditionally. But here I'm plagiarizing my father. Somewhere in the Bible it says, um, Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the, la- Lord, the land that the Lord thy God has given you. I'm going to be 60 next month, so suddenly it's time to start honoring my dad. Um, for this reason, the English service book in, of 1549 refers to the covenant of marriage. And the word has been retained ever since. Last summer, I got married again to Margaret over there. And we had to issue words that sounded a little bit like this. I, Alan, take you, Margaret, to be my wife. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. That is, each of us addresses the other. Each of us addresses the other, making a mutual covenant to love each other unconditionally. And the marriage service enshrines the fact that all true love and all true forgiveness are unconditional. It is this that makes a covenant so different from a contract. A contract is a legal relationship in which two people or two parties sign an impersonal agreement outlining mutual conditions to achieve some future result. It denotes a business deal, the result of a process of bargaining, often through a party system. It takes the form of, if you complete a task by uh, task X by TN, then I shall pay you Y. As Andrew Pinsent has argued, the language of covenant is essentially um, second personal. I, um, I vow. The language of contract is third personal. It articulates an impersonal relationship, a conditional arrangement. Second, Old Testament Torah versus Latin law. Again, okay, so very quickly. Word for covenant, as everybody here knows, is berit, diatheke in Greek. It was translated foius in Latin, and foius means contract. Foius, giving rise to federal theology, was essentially contractual. That was a horrible mistranslation in my view. Right, we can argue about that later. Second, the Old Testament Torah right, versus Latin law. Again, the essential form of the Torah is I thou. I am the Lord thy God who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and so on and so forth. I am the Lord thy God who has been faithful to you. Therefore, as I have been faithful to you, be faithful to me, have no other gods before me, and be faithful to all those others to whom I am faithful. Right? 
be toward them as I am towards you. So therefore, don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't, um, um, don't covet, um, don't murder, and so on. When the lawyer in Luke 10, 27 summarized the Torah, he was just being a good Jew, and Jesus endorsed his summary. The law is, the Torah is summed up, the heart of the Torah is summed up, in loving God and our neighbors ourselves. Again, Torah, nomos in Greek, lex in Latin, interpreted by the West in terms of stoic conceptions of law, miles from the, to- from the heart of the Torah. Third, righteousness, tzedakah, became dika, wasn't he, in Greek? Eustitia, justice, in Latin. Very quickly, righteousness in the Torah is also best understood in a second personal context. I am the Lord thy God who has kept my promises to you and delivered you. God's tzedakah and chesed, his covenant faithfulness, are God's being true to the covenant promises he has made to Israel, his beloved child. Three, these three mistranslations come together. Berit, Torah, tzedakah, done one hand. Covenant, Torah, about God's faithfulness to his people and his desire they are faithful to each And tzedakah, righteousness, have been translated into the history of the Christianity in which we all participate as contra- foidus, contract, lex, story concept, concepts of law and justice, justitia. There's a, I think we've got two different religions here. I said I was going to stir. Okay, the effect um, is to translate essentially filial ways of thinking about God's relationship to humanity into legal ones. Second personal, irreducibly second personal, into third personal ones, which lay out laws, contractual conditions, and the requirements of justice and so on. And very often the cross has been interpreted in the light of that second series of categories. That's something that I'm so it's such a thrill to see contemporary New Testament scholarship and evangelical New Testament scholars radically rethinking. Okay. Second person approaches to think uh, second person approaches think out of God's irreducibly personal orientation toward us, such that the questions we ask, not least about suffering, are framed within that context. They operate in the light of answers to the most fundamental questions. Not the why, but the who question. And the where, the where is God question. And to reiterate the Christian answers to these questions makes interest in the why question secondary. And frankly, almost incidental. Why is it secondary? Because suggested above, when you have an answer to the where question, the why question loses its sting. It ceases to be a defining problem. To commandeer an example that Eleanor Stump um, uses, um, and I do recommend her Wandering in Darkness, and she's just the most fabulous philosophical theologian, um, and that's an enormously um, profound and insightful book. Um, to come to your example, she uses when a mother lets a child with leukemia be given a painful injection of poison by the doctor. By a doctor, the question "why" is not decisive if the child knows who his mother is, that his mother adores him, and would go to the wall for him, and where she is that she's there beside him, with him, holding him in and through the grief that he experiences. The child doesn't need to be asking the why question at that juncture. In radical contrast, third person approaches generate how questions. How can I reconcile God, defined as X, with a human predicament, defined as Y? What results from this is clear. One, the belief that the way to address the problem of suffering is to adopt an Archimedean point, to think not coram deo, the presence of God, but from a detached vantage point, which is what, of course, theodicy effectively involves. By the way, I do need to, need, do need to be honest. I've engaged in a lot of theodicy in the last few years, so, you know, I'm shooting myself here. But um, B, a concern with working out what conditioned God to submit a person to suffering and whether this is because of some failing on the part of the victim. 
the approach of Job's theological friends. I'll just give you an example. Um, um, my previous wife died of cancer. And when Jane was at the, toward, coming towards the very end, some very, very close friends, I don't want to say who, um, very close um, friend came to see her. And she tried to suggest that there must be a reason why God wasn't healing her. After, one, after all, we were all praying fervently for healing. What was blocking it? Something must be conditioning God into not healing her. And the suggestion was that she had, had failed to forgive an uncle for a, a particular crime. Right? To which my wife rather delightfully replied, I have forgiven my uncle. And, she, and the answer was, well, maybe he's not accepted the forgiveness, in which case the forgiveness is not um, complete, because forgiveness is intrinsically bipolar, right? To which she said, so God's killing me, right? Thinking about human suffering within the context now of this picture that I'm genera- I've tried to articulate. First of all, participation. Again, a little bit of more honouring homage to my old man, Dad devoted much of his theological career critiquing all forms of worship that threw the individual back on herself to generate what God requires or demands. His nemesis was the view of worship, was the view that worship is what we do. It's essentially about our worshipping God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we pray to Christ as God, that we invoke the Holy Spirit, that we respond to the preaching of the world, uh, of the word, that we intercede for the world, we offer our money and so on and so forth, that the centre of the whole business is me. Although such a view might be defended on the ground of the priesthood of all believers, and none of us is denying the priesthood of all believers, it's a participative priesthood, um, it falls short, he suggests, of the New Testament understanding of participation through the Spirit in what Christ has done, and more significantly, in what Christ continues to do for us in our humanity. The initiative is no longer with the sole priest of our confession, right? We are, in effect, turned back upon ourselves to generate what is required of us. The result is human-centered. Do it yourself in response to Christ worship that all too easily generates weariness. Jeremy Begbie talks about it as worship as task, as opposed to worship as gift. For my dad, the New Testament understanding of worship sees it as the gift of participating by the Spirit in the incarnate Son's union and communion with the Father. In Jesus Christ, in his intercessions, in his ongoing worship, in his amen to the Father, in his etc., presiding at the Lord's Supper and so on. We have what is a relationship that generates a mediated immediacy in communion with God. Now, to understand this, we have to appreciate the priestly tradition in Scripture. Um, So let's just have a look briefly at this. To appreciate the significance of Hebrews' identification of Jesus as a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, we need to note two things. First, that in Melchizedek, the offices of king and priest are integrated. King and priest are held together. Second, that Melchizedek represents both God to the people, but also the people to God. As Mavinkel famously argued, the leader of the cult in Old Testament was not the priest, but the king. The king is the representative of the deity, yet in this quotation, in a still higher degree, the king is the representative of the people in the presence of the deity. He prays intercedes, offers up sacrifice, and receives power and blessing. And he adds, the covenant is concentrated, co- concentrated in him and through him. This same two-way movement was represented by the priest, Dommershausen um, writes, in oracles and, junction, and instruction, the priest represents God to the people. In sacrifice and intercession, he represents the people to God. As a Collins um, summarizes, Priestly mediation runs in two directions, from God to the people and from the people to God. The fundamental point to notice here is that both the king and the priest represented a twofold movement. God was represented to Israel and Israel to God. 
in the person of the high priest and the king. Moreover, each served as a kind of covenantal hinge between God and Israel. All of this finds a uniquely integrated focus in Melchizedek. Literally, this is, what, this is the, in, in the etymology of it, the king of covenant righteousness, Melchizedek, who possesses such significance in the Christology of Hebrews. Citing Psalm 110.4, the author of Hebrews argues that Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, integrating in his person the roles of both priest and king, and importantly, the bidirectionality I've just mentioned. Jesus' whole life, death, resurrection, and ascension are therefore to be conceived in terms of Christ's role as the priest king. The person of Jesus Christ represents God to humanity and humanity to God. Moreover, given that the incarnation doesn't cease with his death or indeed his resurrection, his ascended life constitutes the fulfillment of his priestly role, a role of ongoing mediation of the one in whom the many participate. Paul argued that there's one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews develops this dynamic by means of the priest king. Now, it's, it is between Hebrews 9 and Romans 8 that we find a really pertinent relationship, that the parallels are most stark. Paul's argument is that all that the Torah requires, the righteous requirement of the, of the Torah, to establish communion with God is fulfilled in Christ. What do we find in Hebrews? The identical argument applied to worship. The righteous requirements of worship, dikaiomata, tesla trias, are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our true representative and priest. Therefore, there's no condemnation. Hold fast to your confession. Back now to Paul. All that God requires of us is provided by God in our place and on our behalf. Not only does the Spirit intercede for us when we don't know how to pray, but he writes, Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, that is, who has entered the Holy of Holies, intercedes for us. Now back to Hebrews. How can we possibly offer prayer and worship that is appropriate? Hebrews 10, 21, 22. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith. In short, as the author is at pains to assist earlier in the book, God has come as one of us, who has identified with us in every respect, who knows our suffering, who has suffered as we suffer, and who now intercedes in our place on our behalf, as the one on behalf of the many, including the many in his person. What emerges is the most remarkable Trinitarian vision of sharing, that's the Hebrews conceptuality, of participating, as Pauline's, Paul's conceptuality uses two words, koinonine and metechine, and they're synonymous. Right? Nothing to do with Plato, by the way. Um, of participating. John, abiding. Okay? So there's Trinitarian vision of sharing, of participating, of abiding by the Spirit en Christo. Not in a dead Christ, but in a living, risen, ascended, and interceding Christ, who is our ongoing mediator, our representative, our intercessor, the representative priest king of our confession. As Athanasius was to write with Hebrews in mind, he became mediator between God and human beings in order that he might minister the things of God to us and of us to God. That's contrarianos. The picture of who and where God is and the character of God's relationship to humanity we find to be profoundly different, therefore, from all this caught up in third-person religion or perfect being theology, which is very often part of um, the theology issue. So what we find is the concrete reality of the communion that God would establish with us, with those who suffer in the context of their suffering, makes anachronistic human attempts to reconcile by philosophical argument a remote divine will with the exigencies of human suffering.
when we're engaging in that kind of project, we've got to be really clear that we stepped right out of a really clear, iterated grammar of communion that we find in John, in Paul, in 1 John, in Hebrews, and so on. So what precisely does this mean? The God of the Bible simply isn't the impersonal metaphysical construct that we find in Parmenides or, or Maimonides, or in certain appropriations of them within the Christian tradition. The God who in the gospel holds forth is an irreducibly triune God, who is love in his innermost being. In the person of his son, he binds us to himself by means of this twofold movement, as he also does by the Spirit, giving us to participate in the ongoing ascended life of the soul priest, who ever leads, lives to intercede for us. Now back to human questioning and human suffering. In questioning in Christ, my, um, my uncle T.F. Torrance, that might also help me, doesn't say you could honour your dad, but your dad and your uncle, that will help as well. And T.F. Torrance argues that Jesus, quote, elicits questions and answers them by making them his own. For by asking them these questions out of the depth of his own existence among men seek. He opens them up to questioning far beyond what they are capable of in themselves and opens up, in the, uh, us, opens up the way for answers beyond anything we can ever anticipate. He continues, nowhere is this more evident than the very last question Jesus asked before he died. Eli, 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 Lema Sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are not primarily the words of Jesus. They're the words of the 22nd Psalm. And everyone's got to read Tom McCall's book on this, which Jesus made his own on the cross. They are the desperate question which human beings direct to God out of the depths of his God-forsakenness and despair. By taking them on his lips, Jesus revealed that he had put himself in humanity's place made our questions his own in order both to ask them in truth and in truth to receive the answers. I'm quoting T.F. here. He was no doubt, T.F. continues, reciting the Psalms, as other utterances on the cross seem to indicate. But when he gave out this fearful cry of dereliction, he was surely not just reciting, but descending into the hell of our darkness and godlessness. He was asking the ultimate question from the point of identification with man in his ultimate need. In doing that, Jesus constituted himself as the center of reference for our questions about God. I'm going to miss a reference to Bonhoeffer um, and, and just con and move towards my conclusion. What emerges by a is a specific kind of triadic joint attention that's being advocated by the gospel. It's again pinching an idea from Eleanor. By the Spirit, the incarnate Son who meets us in the depths of the valley directs us away from ourselves to the Father. So what on earth is triadic joint attention? It's, quote, the highest level of joint attention and um, involves two individuals looking at an object. Each individual must understand that the other individual is looking at the same object and realize that what is taking place is shared attention. For an instance of social engagement, to count as triadic joint attention, it requires at least two individuals attending to an object or a person um, and, um, as a focus of their attention. Additionally, the individual must display awareness that focus is shared between himself or herself and another individual. Triadic attention is marked by the individual looking back to the other individual after looking at the shared object. In short, what defines the Christian faith is a kind of oscillation. By the Spirit, we worship and pray to the Father, through Christ. And then, by the Spirit, the Father holds forth Christ to us as the one in whom we are embraced, understood, accepted, and forgiven. 
the one who brings us into communion, not by solving theoretical problems or by lifting us out of our present sufferings, but by being with us in and through them in radical solidarity as our sole representative, as the one who makes our prayers his prayers and his prayers our prayers. So why has the church lost sight of this resource? If the priesthood of Christ is so central, as the central time society, why has it not been more obvious? Why do we fail to see the moonwalking bear and the awareness test? Briefly, fear of Arianism throughout the church's history has been one factor. People have been so keen to play up Jesus' divinity, we've lost sight of his humanity and his ongoing ascended humanity. Second, a dislike of the priesthood, let's just, let's just call it as it is, dislike of the concept of priesthood in the Protestant traditions. In Protestant circles, we just don't like talking um, about priesthood. So we've not been too quick. We're happier talking about Jesus as king and prophet rather than as priest. Third, Latin anti-Trinitarian tendencies. The tradition has been keen to uphold divine simplicity and there's been a tendency throughout the history of Western Christianity um, to see God as an individual in a sense and lose the grammar of participation. Fourth, all the above have compounded an anthropocentric, individualistic emphasis on the priesthood of believers that forgets that we are priests solely by virtue of participating in Christ's role. Now to conclude. In January 2008, my wife, my first wife, Jane, died at the age of 49. She was the most wonderful Christian woman, a faithful and adoring wife and mother. And watching her die in pain as cancer spread throughout her body was hard. And seeing our four children, what witness her gradual disintegration, not only physically, but mentally, as the cancer spread into her brain, into her frontal lobe, was particularly hard. And there were times when I really struggled to find the wherewithal to pray and indeed to know how to pray and for what to pray for. We would pray for healing, but as the end drew near, it just didn't look like healing was going to happen. And then I felt guilty over my lack of faith and I wondered about the quality of my prayer. I didn't know how to pray as I ought. And in the depth of of that valley, the continuing priesthood of Christ became more relevant than I can begin to communicate. The fact that as I held Jane in my arms, the risen, ascended, sole priest of our confession was present by the Spirit, interceding on our behalf, meant that we could repose in his presence, in what he was doing, and know that communion, that second personal communion, that is the beginning and tell us of everything. And the prayer I held on to during that time, and that I've held on since during struggles with clinical depression, was the Lord's Prayer, recognizing that it was indeed the Lord's Prayer. I was not left to pray on my own. My Father who art in heaven, far removed from where I am. The sole priest of our confession was present by his spirit, praying with Jane and with me, our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. To discover that the continuing priesthood of Christ recapitulates the entire gospel is to discover the meaning of Emmanuel and of grace and of the triune life of God in a way that stands to transform every facet of our lives and most significantly how we struggle, our struggle with suffering. It is to discover quite simply the meaning of life in Christo by the Spirit.
It is to be set free to live ex curvatus ex se, to use Luther. Turned away from ourselves. No longer reposing on ourselves, but reposing on Christ. Looking to the Father by the Spirit. When we discover his answer to the where question and the who question, then we know that our faith no longer requires an answer. Certainly not now to the why question. Thank you.